رحم الله من قرا سوره الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين الصراط صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير الغضب عليهم ولا الضالين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي قصرت عن رؤيته ابصار الناظرين وعجزت عن نعته اوهام الواسفين الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما بلغ معه السعي قال يا بني إني أرى في المنام أني يذبحك فانظر ماذا ترى قال يا أبتي فعل ما تمر ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين فلما أسلمنا وتله للجبين وناديناه أن يا إبراهيم قد صدقت الرؤيا إن كذلك نجز المحسنين صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The verses that I recited are from chapter 37 ayat number 102 to 105 Last night our discussion stopped when we discussed the first step in these five steps that I have promised inshallah to deliver before the end of the ashra that are under the topic of deen faith and our responsibilities and indeed the first responsibility that we discussed last night was the responsibility of recognition and marifat of deen because without marifat you can't really proceed to the second level the third level the fourth and the fifth this marifat of deen becomes that foundation in order for one to excel and get to the second level and that second level is something which inshallah we will be discussing here tonight I won't go too much in the first step that we discussed. Alhamdulillah, the video is available online. And uh, if you need to catch up to it, it's there. But just briefly, we had mentioned how important this marifat is. And we had stepped and we had mentioned the different levels of this marifat. Of course, some people, their marifat is higher than the marifat of some other people. The level of recognition might be high for some and might not be as high for the others. For example, those who even lived in the time of our Prophet, their level of marifat deferred. The marifat that Salman was at, the marifat that Abu Dhar was at, the marifat Ammar al-Yasir had, was different than the marifat of some of the other companions of Rasulullah. And then, these were categories where 
those who heard Rasulullah, they believed in him. Those who saw Rasulullah, they believed in him. Those who heard and saw Rasulullah still did not believe in him. So there's something else that is not an automatic. That here you hear something, not necessarily you'll believe in it. Hearing and seeing will not obviously and all the time lead to believing. That's why you find all these Abu Jahls, Abu Lahabs, and other characters that exist in the time of Rasulullah did not believe. They didn't bring Iman. Although some, by just seeing Rasulullah, by just hearing Rasulullah, they believed in him. There were many who did not bring Iman. So therefore, even when you look into those who brought Iman into Rasulullah, onto Rasulullah, you find they had different categories as well. Salman is somewhere where Rasulullah says, As Salmanu minna ahlul bayt. He's at the level of as if like ahlul bayt. So, therefore, these different categories exist. Now, with that said, ma'rifat, inshallah, is something which we need to gain as far as our deen is concerned. We mentioned a few tips regarding how we can go about it. First and foremost, of course, we need to study this deen. Realize that this is our need. And if something is, in your, is your need, you should not be neglecting it. The second step, without much more muqaddama, is taslim e kamil or what is known as submission to the faith. And not just an ordinary submission, but complete submission to the faith. Here the ahkam are tough. The laws are difficult. They're not easy. You know, sabr is done on three steps, right? Sabr in front of Musiba. Sabr is also done in front of Masiya. That you do sabr in front of a haram. Refrain from committing that haram. Refrain from committing that masiyat. That requires sabr. So ahkam are not easy. Nobody's saying that they are going to be easy. While the ahkam may not be easy, for some, praying to Rukh salat is the most difficult thing in the world to do. For some, standing up for the 11 rakat of Salatul Layl is walk in the park. Not that difficult. For some, fasting is utmost difficult. And fasting is a difficult ibadat. It's not an easy ibadat. It takes a toll on your body. You need to be healthy in order to fast. That's why if you don't meet the criteria, then you don't have to fast. More difficult ibadat, hajj. It's not that easy. Not only that you need to be physically fit, but you need to be financially fit as well in order to perform the hajj. Without it, hajj is not obligatory upon you. There was a man in the time of our fourth imam, Imam Zainul Abideen, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was watching people do the tawaf of Kaaba. And he said, Al-Ajabu wal-Ajab. It's surprising, it's so difficult that all the ibadat are tough, especially this ibadat that I see in front of me. People are, you know, walking around the Kaaba and in the heat of the, the desert. It's very difficult to do this ibadat. Imam responded to him. He said, Al-Ajabu wal-Ajab. It is surprising that how can one 
attain paradise with all the difficulties of ibadat that exist. Imam looked at him and he responded right away. Laysa al-ajab. He said, al-ajab mimman naja kayfa naja. It's surprising that how can someone succeed with all the difficulty of ibadat? Imam responded by saying, Laysa al-ajab mimman naja kayfa naja. It's not surprising to see if someone is successful that how are they successful? Rather, ajab and surprising aspect is man halaka kayfa halak, the one who is annihilated. Ma'asat rahmatillah, with all the wasi rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given so much rahmat every step of the way. You see these uh, examples of rahmat, for example, in the month of Ramadan, when you breathe, it's considered to be tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you sleep, it's considered to be ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You smile at someone that is considered to be sadaqah. You remove Hurdles from front of someone that is considered to be the best type of sadaqa in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rawayat of 7th Imam, Awnuka lidda'if afdalu sadaqa. When you help an elderly, that is the best type of sadaqa. You don't have to be financially strong to be able to give sadaqa. All of these are the masadiq of sadaqa. So easy. So Imam responded right away. He said, Laysa la jab mimman naja kaifa naja. It's not surprising the one who succeeded with the performance of the ibadat that they were successful. No, on the contrary, it is more surprising how someone cannot succeed with all the vast rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that exists. That He gives you opportunities every step of the way. So bringing you to the point, Taslim kamil and complete submission to ahkam ilahi. We can't be picky and choosy. Oh, this is too difficult for me to do. I can't do it. This is something which I'm not made out for. If you believe in one ayat of Quran, you should believe in the entire Quran. You cannot be afatuminuna be ba'd al kitab wa takfuruna be ba'd. Ayat the Quran says that do you believe in some portions of Quran and then you deny the remaining portions of Quran? How is that possible? Either you believe the entire thing or you don't believe it. You can't say, I believe 90% of Quran. I believe in 90% of the ahkam that are wajib upon me. I've heard a story from scholars. There's a group of people that went to Ayatul Akhui, Rahmatullah Alayhi. And they said to him, or probably Ayatullah Burujardi, correct? They went to Ayatullah Burujardi, who lived in the 50s and the 60s, marja of his time. They went up to him, they said, We are your muqallid for 350 days a year. But for the 10 days of Muharram, we don't do your taqlid. We want to commemorate the aza, and because of some of your fatawa, it goes against it. We don't do your taqlid. So 350 days a year, we'll do your taqlid, but 10 days, we won't do your taqlid. And if you're doing taqlid, you do taqlid every single day. You can't be picky and choosy. You follow one marja, he says, this is forbidden. So, well, I don't believe in it. You don't do ishtihad yourself. Nobody's forcing you to do taqlid, right? Sometimes people think that, and we touched upon the concept of marja'iyat the other day, that ishtihad is forced upon us or taqlid is forced upon us. No, nobody's forcing taqlid onto you. 
you can go ahead and become a mujtahid yourself. Study the deen, religion in depth, and you can be a mujtahid. Then you don't need to follow anyone. Because there are four possible scenarios. An ignorant follows an ignorant. A knowledgeable follows a knowledgeable. A knowledgeable follows an ignorant. Or an ignorant follows a knowledgeable. Right? These are four scenarios. If a jahil, I'll use the Arabic terminology. Ignorant, jahil. If a jahil follows another jahil, what good is that? Two blind men standing on the side of the street. One says, can you help me cross the road? They're both blind. How are they going to be able to help each other? Nobody can see. Someone who's knowledgeable asks and refers to someone who's jahil. That is haram. Not only your uncle says they should not do this, it's haram. You have eyes, you can see, and you're asking a blind person to help you cross. The third scenario, an alim follows another alim. Knowledgeable follows another. It doesn't help because both know. Both have eyes and both are capable of crossing. The only rational scenario that is left is what? A jahil, an ignorant, follows an alim, someone who is knowledgeable. And that's what taqlid is. And you do that in every walk of life. Every aspect of your life. But when it comes to deen, we have reservations. You don't have to. Nobody's forcing you to do taqlid. You can go ahead and become mujtahid yourself. You don't have to follow. You think the marajah that are in our time, are they doing taqlid of someone? No. Forget the marajah. Hundreds and even thousands of mujtahideen who have not declared their marjayat, they don't follow anyone. They do ishtihad themselves. But because you and I don't have that sort of time and energy and tawfiq, we don't become marja. We don't become mushtahid. So what's the easiest thing to do? Follow. Just like you follow in any other aspect of your life, you follow in deen as well. So nobody's twisting your arm. Nobody's forcing you to do so. That is the only rational and logical means for you to fulfill your duties. And so what am I going to follow the marjain? Salat, I already know how to pray. What am I going to follow the marjain? Fasting, I already know how to fast. Yeah, when you go to Hajj, that's where the problem arises. Who are you going to be following the rules of? So I learned Salat from Quran. I learned Salat and I learned fasting from Quran. Well, can you learn Hajj from Quran? Are there enough rules about Hajj in Quran? In fact, you didn't even learn Salat from Quran. Nobody can prove two rakat prayer from Quran. I challenge you. You can't. All it says in Quran, Aqib is Salat. Establish the prayer. All it says in Quran, Yuqimuna Salat. But never does it mention anywhere in Quran how to perform this Salat. Who taught us? The Prophet. He says, Sallu kamara aytumuni usalli. Pray how you have seen me pray. So when you've seen Rasulullah pray, you started following him, and you did that taqlid. So therefore, ahkam are difficult. But we cannot pick and choose what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Now I'm going to mention some things where a lot of people have problems. And I don't want you to get offended. A lot of people question about music. What type of music is halal and what type of music is not halal? All these questions come about. The Maharaj have said, music is haram, is haram. Music which is, of course, suitable for, you know, entertainment gathering. 
is haram. That's one masala that comes about. People say, ah, I don't believe in it. That's what you say, ah, I don't believe in it. For example, wearing gold for men is haram. What's the logic? To be honest with you, I have no idea. No idea. I have not come across a logical explanation of why wearing gold for men is haram. Wearing gold for women is permissible. Wear as much as you want to. But wearing gold for men is forbidden in Islam. Now what's the logical dalil? I don't have one. I don't think anyone has one. No, there are some responses that are given, but logically something which will make sense, there isn't one. Does that mean because there isn't a logical dalil, I'm going to go ahead and do this thing? Similarly, there are many other things. Hijab, people question. Where does it say in Quran how to observe hijab? Again, do you pray daily? Yes, I do. Where does it say in Quran how to pray? But you still pray, don't you? Similarly, if it doesn't mention in Quran, are you going to stop doing it? We understand. We don't take ahkam only from Quran. We take ahkam from Quran and the sunnat. It mentions in sunnat how to perform these things. Wajibat are mentioned there. Muharramat are mentioned there. So therefore, let's be completely submissive toward the faith. Another thing is, you know, keeping a beard. Shaving a beard, for example. Haram, the discussion is there. And a lot of people say, well, how can beard be, you know, responsible for someone's faith and, you know, face of their faith? You know what? One of the conditions for adalat and justice is facial hair. When you're looking for two adil witnesses, one thing that, because we don't know who, what is one made of. We only go with zahir. We don't know the bottom of each other. I don't know what someone has done. Do you know what I've done all day long? No. You don't know my good or bad. If you ask me, Morana, what goods you've done since morning, I'll count 10, 20, 30 for you right now. Oh, I woke up in the morning. I prayed this salat and I did this and I answered these many questions and I read Quran and I... And then you ask, Marana, how many haram did you did since the morning? Oh, haram, no, no, no. Now I want to go ahead and protect myself. Because I don't want to make myself look bad in front of you. I have something what is called hubbezat, hubbenafs, love for myself, right? I don't want myself to be humiliated in front of others. So one of the conditions for just witnesses is the facial hair. People question about it. You can question all you want to. Ahkam, complete submission. That's what's required. Now, of course, some people may have, you know, reasons for which they can't do some of these things. This is where exception comes into play. And there is exception in Islam. There is exception in Quran. The ayah that I recited for you. The story of Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Ismail. It's the epitome of complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have difficult time, complete submission into, uh, toward some of the ahkam. Let alone when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs our blood, what are we going to do then? I hope he doesn't need our blood. We have difficult time fulfilling the submission toward the mere ahkam that are easy. But look at the epitome of it. Look at the peak of submission in the story of Hazrat Ibrahim and his smile. When he was old enough to help out his father, Hazrat Ismail, he said, Kala ya bunaya, O my beloved son, inni araf al-manam, I have seen in my dream, anni adbahukam, 
sacrificing you, slaughtering you. Fandor madatara. What is your opinion? Hazrat Ibrahim does not need to ask for opinion from anyone. Why? He's a Nabi. He's Ma'asum. He should fulfill the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he still asks. Maybe he's showing that look, the way I am submissive to the command of Allah, my son is also on the same path. Fandur Mazatara, what is your opinion? He said, Ya Bati, if Al Matumar, you all know the story. I'm not going to relate the story. Just derive this point from it. Ya Bati, if Al Matumar, do what you've been commanded. Satajaduni, inshallah, mina sabirin. You'll find me amongst those who are sabir, patient. The ayat continues. What does the ayat say? Is a falamma aslama wa tallahu lil jameen. When both of them had submitted to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he placed him onto that place where he wanted to go ahead and kill him or to slaughter him. Wanadainahu, we called upon them. Ain ya Ibrahim, O Ibrahim, qad saddaqta ru'ya. Indeed, you have fulfilled the vision that you had seen, and we will not make the good deeds of righteous people go to waste. That is the peak of submission. Allah asked Hazrat Ibrahim for his son. Does Allah SWT need the son of Hazrat Ibrahim? That too, the son that he has given him at an old age. It's not like Hazrat Ibrahim had tens of sons. So giving one away would be easy. It still would not be easy. But this is a son that has been given to him at an old age. Now he's old enough to help out his father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I want to see, are you completely attached to your son? Or if he were to ask you to detach yourself, will you detach yourself to him? And then when Allah responds, he says, no, we were just testing you. We don't need the flesh and the blood of your son. That is not something which is required. In fact, when you give qurbani of an animal on Eid al-Adha, following the sunnah of Hazrat Ibrahim, والسلام, even the flesh and the blood of that is not required by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayat of Quran says what? وَلَنْ يَنَالَ اللَّهَ لُحُومُهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا Neither the flesh nor the blood reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What reaches Allah? وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ What reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the piety from you. How muttaqi are you as far as your amal is concerned? Allahumma Amir al-Mu'mineen Imam al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam said Ad-deenu shajaratun Deen is like a tree Asluha at-taslim wal-rida The roots of this deen lies in submission, taslim, and rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being satisfied with Allah. This is where we need to understand, if I understood and I have gained the marifat of religion, I do not have the right to question the demands of the religion. Have you heard this? I'm not that religious. People come up to you and say, well, I'm not that religious. Or you receive a rishta for your daughter or for your son and say, well, we're not that religious. What does that even mean? That you're not that religious. Either you're religious or not. There's no that religious. That doesn't make sense. Either you are madhabi or ghair madhabi. Simple. But you can't say that madhabi. 
And then they elaborate. Meaning, in our house, nobody observes hijab. We are religious only to the extent of Muharram. And that's it. Ten days of Muharram, you'll see us. Outside of that, you may not see. So that's their category. That's their distinction that we're not that religious. That is the wrong distinction. If you've signed up for this madhab, if you've signed up for this religion, then you're all the way in it. Or you're not in it. I'll relate a story of a man by the name Harun Makki. It's the time of our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al Sadiq, alayhi salatu wa salam. And you know the times of later Imams, how they didn't have the power and the iqtidar and the government in their hands. Even after, you know, all the way from our first Imam, none of the Imams really held any office. Aside from 8th Imam, who was then forced into accepting this crownship. But none of the Imams held any office. So it's time of 6th Imam. A person from Khurasan comes and says to Imam, Imam, we have 100,000 men ready for your command. If you order today, we'll rise with you. And we will stand by you. Will support you. Why don't you stand up like your forefather or grandfather, Imam Hussein, did? He rose against Yazid. Why don't you do the same thing? Why don't you rise? Imam asked one of his servants to light up the oven, tanur. In the oven, they had opened tanur and ovens where they used to bake the bread. And there's fire in it. One of Imam's companions by the name Harun Makki, who walked in. Imam said to this Khurasani that that tanur is fired up. I want you to go and sit in it. He got scared. He said, Mola, here I'm offering my life to you. I'm offering 100,000 men who are ready to sacrifice themselves for you. And you're telling me to go sit into that firehouse? Into that oven? Mola, what, what mistake have I made? Did I say something wrong? Please forgive me. Imam said, I forgive you. At the same time, Harun and Makki walks in. Imam says, oh, Harun. He says, yes, Mola. That tanur you see, that oven, go sit in it. Harun puts his head down, goes inside the oven, and sits. Now here, Imam is engaging in conversation with Khurasani. Khurasani is a little bit worried. The asar of worries, he's worrisome that that man is probably baked and cooked by now. And while Imam is speaking to him, Imam says, O Harun, come out of the tanur. Harun comes out of the tanur. And not a single hair was burned. Wow. Wow. Now some might be thinking, this story is far-fetched. No, the story has roots in Quran. Remember when Hazrat Ibrahim was thrown into the fire by Namrud? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order the fire to do? Ya naro kuni bardan wa salama ala Ibrahim. O oh fire, be cool and sound to Ibrahim. Don't burn him. Fire is supposed to do what? Burn. That's the nature of fire. But it's also subservient to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, fire is subservient to the command of Imam of the time as well. So if Imam says to Harun Makki, enter into the tanur, Imam has already ordered the fire not to burn him. Harun doesn't know that. He is fulfilling the command of his mawla, knowing that my mawla 
knows best for me. And he wouldn't just want me to die like this in vain. When Harun comes out, Imam says to this Khurasani, how many of those 100,000 that you promised are like Harun Makki? He said, not one. Not a single person. Imam said, when you have enough, like Harun Makki, come back, who are completely submissive to our command, then inshallah we will rise and we will call for this Nihazah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I've run out of my time, and we did not complete this second step, which is complete submission to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Complete submission to the faith, the ahkam. But of course, it is a difficult task. And for that reason, even if something is going against you, don't hesitate. Ahkam, even if it is harmful to you, don't hesitate. Person came to a sixth Imam and he said, asked a question. Imam said, No, this cannot be done. The answer went against him. Many a time people come up to us and they ask us questions and they don't get the answer of their liking. I can't make up the question, I can't make up the answer. It is what it is. Or they'll ask for a stahara, stahara comes out bad. They'll ask for another stahara. The moment they ask for the second stahara, I know that they are persistent in what they want to hear. They want to get a positive result from it. Imam said, Isbir ala hadha. Have patience on that which has come against you. Awadahu Allahu bihi khair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it with something khair in it for you. Even if something is going against you. Everything was going against Sayyid al-Shuhada. In Karbala, Imam alayhi wa as he marches into Karbala, Imam is inviting people. He invites a man by the name Ubaidullah ibn Hurra Jofi. Imam saw him there outside of the city of Kufa. Imam said, come and join us. He said, Mawla, keep me out of this conflict. Take my shield, take my horse, but don't drag me into this conflict. Imam said to him, I don't need your shield, I don't need your zira, I don't need your sword, I don't need your horse. Go far away from this place, because tomorrow when I raise istaghasa, and you hear and you don't say la back to it, Allah will hold you accountable. So for your sake, leave this place. This is someone Imam invited. There's another man that Imam invites. Zuhair ibn Qayyim, as he was coming back from Makkah as well, he was a little bit ahead of Imam and keeping his distance. Imam sends a messenger to him. Messenger comes and delivers a message that Hussein ibn Ali is asking for you. Zuhair is hesitant. He doesn't want to go. He's known for being loyal to the third Khalifa. His wife said, why don't you go? He said, I know what he's going to ask me. He said, well, at least go listen to the grandson of Rasulullah. If you don't want to do it, you can just say no to him. But just not going is not the right thing to do. Zuhair listens to his wife, comes to the tent of Imam. Someone who was reluctant to even see Imam comes back and says to his wife, you're free to go. He was a very... Wealthy man, he said, all my wealth is now yours. I'm going to stay with Imam Hussein. He said, oh, Zuhair, what happened? A moment ago, you didn't want to go and see Imam and listen to what he had to say. Now you are saying that you take everything and you're going to stay over here? What transpired? He said, Hussein showed me between his fingers what is about to happen. That's the second person that Imam invited. 
those whom Imam could not invite directly, Imam wrote letters to. One of those individuals is Habib ibn Muzahir. You know who Habib is? Habib is Imam's childhood friend. Habib and Imam are the same age. Habib is friend of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Imam writes a letter, sends it to Habib. Namabar brings the letter, Barid brings the postman, brings the letter, knocks on the door. Habib receives the letter of Imam, opens it up, and sees this written, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. من الحسين ابن علي إلى الرجل الفقيه حبيب ابن المظاهر الأسدي from حسين to حبيب رجل فقيه knowledgeable فقيه an عالم if I give this title to someone it's me giving this title but if Hussein calls someone faqih, just imagine what the status of that individual would be. Habib reads this letter. He kisses the letter. These are the words written by Imam. He puts them on his eyes as tabarruk. His wife says, oh, Habib, what has Hussein written? He said, Hussein is asking for my help. Hussein ne He's asking for my help. Oh, Habib, what have you decided? I'm thinking if I go, I will not return. And therefore you will become a widow. I'm thinking if I go and I will not return, our children will become orphans. While Habib said these things, ek dafa Habib ki zauja ko jala lata hai. Eh Habib, tumhe apne biwi bachon ke bewa aur yateem ka khayal hai. Tumhe Hussain ke bewa aur yateem ka khayal nahi hai. Ajrukumal Allah. Ye jazba tha Habib ki zauja mein. The same jazba should be in the wives of our community. That they should ask their husbands, did you not go to majlis today? Why didn't you go to majlis of Sayyid al-Shuhada today? Or are you going to the majlis of Shuhada, Sayyid al-Shuhada today? What time are you going to go to the majlis today? How come you didn't go to the majlis yesterday? We are not asking for the sacrifice, but at least attending these majalis. Don't squander this opportunity. Habib ki zauja ye keh rahi hai, ki tumhe Hussain کہ بیوی کے بیوی کے بیوہ ہونے کا وہ نہیں ہے غم نہیں ہے تمہیں یہ غم ہے کہ تمہاری بیوی بیوہ نہ ہو جائے تمہیں یہ غم ہے کہ تمہارے بچے یتیم نہ ہو جائیں حسین کے بچے یتیم ہوں حجر حکم اللہ حبیب سیڈ نو آئی واز جسٹ ٹیسٹنگ یو آئی وانٹ ٹو سی ویئر یور فیتھ لائز دیٹ ایف آئی واز ٹو گو اینڈ آف کورس آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو گو آر یو گوئنگ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ مائی موو said, oh, Habib, this is not an ordinary individual. This is the grandson of Rasulullah, Hussein, who's calling for you. Not saying labag to Hussein is guaranteeing Jahannam. Oh, Habib, go. This is saadat for you that Hussein has chosen you like this. Uh, of course, Habib is tariqe se. Most jagah se nahi nikal sakte the. Chukhi har jagah naka bandi hui vi thi. پہرے لگے ہوئے تھے حبیب نے اپنے اپنے غلام کو گھوڑا دے کے کہا کہ تم فلاں جگہ پہ میرا انتظار کرنا اور میں تمہیں آ کے وہاں پہ ملوں گا حبیب تھوڑی سی دیر میں مشکلوں سے گزرتے ہوئے اس مقام کے قریب پہنچے تو تھوڑی دیر ہو گئی تھی تاخیر ہو گئی تھی ابھی حبیب نے یہ سنا 
کہ غلام اس گھوڑے کے کان میں یہ کہہ رہا ہے کہ اگر میرے آقا نہ آئے تو تم تم پریشان نہ ہونا میں تم پہ سوار ہو کے جاؤں گا اور میں قربانی دوں گا حبیب نے یہ الفاظ سنے ایک دفعہ سوچا ہوگا کہ حسین مظلوم پہ کیا وقت آ گیا ہے کہ غلام اس طریقے سے جذبہ شہادت رکھتے ہیں اجر اللہ حبیب گوز ٹو ورڈس ہی ٹیکس آن دا رینج آف دا ہورس سوار ہوتے ہیں گھوڑے کے اوپر اور کربلا پہنچتے ہیں ابھی کربلا سے نزدیک پہنچے تھے دور سے کسی گھوڑ سوار کے آنے کی اطلاع ملی اب تک جو بھی آتا تھا بری خبر لاتا تھا اشکیا کے اشکیا کی فوجیں آتی تھیں کوئی پانی بند کرنے آتا تھا کوئی اور کوئی چیز لے کے آتا تھا اب جب دیکھا دور سے کوئی گھوڑ سوار آ رہا ہے سب کھڑے ہو گئے کہ اب یہ کون آتا ہے ایک دفعہ جب حبیب نزدیک ہوئے تو لوگوں نے پہچان لیا لوگوں نے پہچان لیا کہ یہ حبیب ہیں حسین کے دوست ہیں بس یہ دیکھنا تھا ایک خوشی کی لہر دوڑ گئی جیسے کسی نے جنگ جیت لی ہو حبیب کے آتے ہی حبیب کے پہنچتے ہی سب مسرور ہیں سب خوش ہیں حبیب آئے حسین نے گلے سے لگایا اے حبیب تم نے ہمارے خط کا جواب دیا اے حبیب تم نے ہماری دعوت پہ لبیک کہا اے حبیب تمہارے شکر گزار ہیں مولا یہ کیا بات کرتے ہیں حبیب کی جان قربان ہے بس یہ خبر خیمہ گاہ تک پہنچ زینب کو پتا چلا حسین کا بچپن کا ساتھی آیا ہے حسینب نے فضا سے کہا ہے فضا ذرا حبیب تک ہمارا سلام پہنچا دینا ادھر فضا آتی ہے اے حبیب تم پر سلام ہو زینب آنیا نے سلام بھیجا ہے حبیب نے امامہ اتارا سر پہ خاک ڈالی ارے یہ وقت آ گیا ہے شہزادیوں کے اوپر ہم غلاموں کے اوپر سلام بھیجیں الا لعنت الله القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا اي منقلب ينقلبون ان لله وانا اليه راجعون ماتم حسین